thank you so very much for joining us thank here on uh, Afro World View. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank well, as a start, Minister, recently uh, your department uh, revealed that staggering 55 uh, municipalities can be classified as distressed and dysfunctional. Uh, let's talk about what you've identified as having been the, the, the root cause of, of the problem. And I suppose on the back of that, what's your idea in terms of where to start in a situation like this where we have what I think is a crisis? And I wonder, Minister, if you would agree that this, this <coughs> is a crisis. Well, I think that uh, there, there are a number of challenges here. Uh, we have classified the municipalities that really the ones that are well functioning and that have got no challenges, I would say about 7%. And about 31% uh, uh, are reasonably functional. And then uh, about another 31 are reasonably uh, dysfunctional, um, almost dysfunctional. And then another 31 percent we consider to be completely dysfunctional. We've uh, allocated, we've actually um, calculated about 87 municipalities, which uh, we will need to intervene on on various things, which require intervention of both Treasury and National Culture Department. And amongst these are problems where we see the issues of governance, the issues of uh, uh, financial management. There are issues of uh, infrastructure uh, delivery or service delivery. Then there are others where we've got to deal with the general problems of uh, investigations into corruptions and the political instability issues. Mm -hmm. So we're taking that package. <clears throat> we're taking that package, and we want to actually intervene on literally all of those and try and turn them around. And so um, we have a program uh, wherein we uh, are setting up teams to go and support uh, municipalities. So the one team, for example, will deal with the issues of governance. That team goes to look at the municipal manager, the qualifications, posts, the numbers of posts that are vacant, that are not filled, whether people have got the right qualifications, whether they've got uh, bloated uh, you know, um, uh, uh, establishment and all of that. We then have to help them to downsize and get to the right size. And then, of course, we look at the uh, compliance with the necessary reg regulations for uh, governance to be, you know, properly, uh, you know, um, uh, seen to be uh, in place. Then the second lot are those which are uh, teams that will go in to deal with uh, problems of uh, financial recovery and all the financial uh, issues, starting from the qualification of the um, chief financial officer. We want to know whether they've got the right qualifications and all the staff. Uh, have got the uh, proper qualifications to manage the accounting sections. Yeah. And then in addition, we look at you know how they work. Do they have the numbers uh, of people who understand budgeting so that they do the cashback budgeting? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. A, a number of the municipalities, they have a budget that's really not cashback. So it really runs on a huge deficit when we can't adopt a budget like that. And then um, the question of revenue generation, the number of municipalities have got challenges there, and expenditure management. So oh, those are some of the teams that we're sending. Now, now Minister, you've obviously <coughs> clearly started to get to the root of uh, that problem. You've uh, deployed municipal capacity experts, as you say, to provide that support to municipalities. So let me just ask you, in terms <coughs> of the concern that one would have of how much this is co costing the state, because that in itself is, is, is another cost on its own. Apart from that, how <clears throat> long do we anticipate that these task forces will be there to help uh, the municipalities? And I suppose a third question is, I would assume that some of these uh, uh, experts would be finding some kind of mismanagement, some kind of corruption, all kinds of things that they would be sort of digging up in the process of them being there. So I wonder, Minister, is there a possibility that those in local government, those that are in leadership in these municipalities, could sabotage the works of these, those that you've put to try and help the situation? Okay, <clears throat> let me separate them out. Yeah. The, the first group I talk about that deals with governance, we're tending mostly... Uh, staff from COCTA and then we're reinforcing them. In the next few weeks we'll announce some of the panels that will go and reinforce. They'll go for several months, help them to you know, sort their structures out and so on. And in the process, 
they will then uh, kind of give them capacity and then they'll pull out. So they'll be very short term in the way they'll interact with them. The same with those on financial recovery. You'll have Treasury, uh, COCTA, and then of course we'll bring other additional people to go and assist. And then uh, in, they have to be set in motion because they must run on their own. You know, have, after having been corrected, so we'll do regular spot checks and regular uh, update and uh, capacity building on an ongoing basis. Yes. Then the third lot are the ones where we sent uh, uh, engineers, town planners, regional planners, and um, um, uh, 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 chartered accountants to go and manage the infrastructure uh, projects. These ones <clears throat> are, are particularly a concern because we found that 55 out of 257 municipalities have got engineers that the rest don't have. Mm. So we're targeting the first 55 again of municipalities where we're going to be bringing in uh, technical capacity. So all the uh, engineers, chief engineers that we're sending in from last week are actually going to be permanently stationed in districts. Uh, we've calculated that uh, those municipalities will need uh, capacity at district level so that they can then deal with the issue of planning infrastructure, yeah. implementing infrastructure projects, uh, monitoring that uh, those are being properly executed. And all of this uh, is something that is an intervention that's going to go on until 2021. And um, these are actually employed by COCTA at national level. Now, you'll know that over the years, uh, through what we call a back to basics program, where we want the municipalities to do the simple things that municipalities must do mm -hmm. fix the uh, roads, uh, remove, uh, you know, fix the potholes, uh, ensure that electricity uh, lights are, 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 are working, and ensure that uh, there's no rubbish dumping in the, in the streets, the street, uh, you know, uh, veggies are cut, and all of those issues that the water leaks are fixed, and so on, which are simple maintenance issues. Now, you need a, a capacity technical capacity to be able to do that. So a lot of the municipalities have that challenge. So whilst we send them in, we've also want to, we also want to ensure that the municipal infrastructure grant is properly spent. There are lots of grants that are given to municipalities. You can only access them if you have got um, the uh, expertise to apply for the projects uh, to be financed, and then you can receive the funding. Yes. And once you receive the funding, you must spend within you must spend it within the right time and, and execute properly, and so on. So what we found that in the past uh, five years, when we analysed, we found that most of the municipalities, um, in about 8.4 billion out of 47 billion, has actually been allocated <clears throat> and then uh, removed uh, from those municipalities and brought back simply because they were not complying because of lack of capacity. Mm. Well, 3.4 billion was actually just taken away from municipalities because they could not spend. And these are poor municipalities that have got no capacity, that have got no revenue base. So we felt that taking away from them means that for poor communities, we are not able to give uh, the support that they need. So we're now putting this capacity permanently there to go and deal with all of these infrastructure projects. You know, a lot of the time, and, 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 and I want to sort of talk more about, you know, service delivery protests later on, but just as a start, you know, when we hear about service delivery pro, uh, protests, you'll always hear somebody, you know, the, the, the community leaders, whoever it is, uh, complaining mostly about the, 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 the government that's in place there, the local uh, government. So, Minister, in a, in a case where you do find that there has been ghost <coughs> mismanagement, yes. and the term I hate to use, but I have to use it, where there has been some kind of uh, corruption, what is COCTA going to do? We, we actually, uh, are part of what we have to do is to deal with corruption. Yeah. And part of dealing with it is that uh, the municipalities, when there are reports of uh, impropriety or corruption, fraud, they actually have to investigate. Investigate internally, then also bring in forensic audits and in, uh, audit that. And also, if they are unable to do that, they need to call for reinforcement from the provincial COCTA and Treasury or, or even national uh, uh, government to come and intervene or support or to reinforce. Mm -hmm. And so, in some instances, when we receive the complaints from national office, 
We send it back to say this must be investigated. And we expect the municipalities to investigate, and when they do, uh, then of course we want to know what action they've taken. So in this whole area, <clears throat> we are then ensuring that uh, the municipalities uh, uh, investigate and then they report to us. We, we have um, a file where all the investigations that have been done in all the municipalities, I think at the moment we've got about 500 of them. We, we have got details of what municipality are we talking about, what uh, uh, transgression was reported, which are the names of the, who are the people who are involved and their names and their ranks, were they suspended or not? Yeah. And then uh, has the matter been taken to the police? What's the case number? Is it in court? Who's the prosecutor? Who are the investigating officers? Uh, has the case been closed? Uh, are you, uh, have you taken internal disciplinary hearings? So we monitor that entire thing mm -hmm. from a uh, national cocktail. And where we think that it's, uh, the actions taken are not adequate, we send in a team to go and actually demand that the municipality must act on various in in individuals. We even have a database now. This database takes the names of people who have been involved in uh, corruption or in any tra transgressions. If we remove them or whether they resign or they get dismissed, we have a database then we will always make sure that before any municipality has employed any person, we check them against the database yes. so as to stop them so that they do not move on to run to another municipality. So we are very that are now on investigation of, uh, you know, of, of corruption. But the primary responsibility for the investigation is with the municipality because they are a sphere of government that manages the, the, the municipal space. And we need to then you know, oversee that as it were. So in all the municipalities, we call uh, them to bring up all these reports. Let's have a look. If there's something that we think should have been investigated and was not investigated, we go, we go back to them and actually cause them to investigate. So we're very thorough on that aspect as well. I mean, and Minister, we know that people are well within their <coughs> rights uh, sure. to protest, but surely this shouldn't be the sort of status quo. This shouldn't be something that every time we're reporting on the news, there's some kind of violent protest that's, that's erupted. But I want to come uh, to the issue of, and, and I like the fact that you spoke about, you know, leaders leaving their communities and then losing touch and moving on to the, the towns. And I, I just want to tell you a personal story where I was driving through Alexandra heading towards Santon. And I remember just thinking as I was driving along, seeing that uh, sewerage on the roads, sure. the potholes, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, standard of living uh, that people are actually in despair. And I, as I drove there, as I drove through, and, I, and then I got to Santon and saw, you know, it's a concrete jungle. It's one of the most expensive cities, I suppose, in, the, in, in Africa. And I wondered to myself, is there an actual drive still can our government really say that they are still wanting to address uh, the, the gross inequalities uh, in, in our country when just here <coughs> I'm seeing such a gap uh, in terms of how people are, are, are living? I mean, it is a really deplorable way of living um, when you drive through, through Alexandra. And I, and I really wanted to uh, put you to task on that one, sir. Actually, um, that's one glaring example of the inequality of South Africa. The most um, uh, opulent uh, piece of real estate uh, in South Africa would be in Sentin. And three kilometers outside of that is you, some of the worst koala in the country. Yes. That, uh, you know, uh, gaping inequality is something that the country has to address. It's going to take us a while to deal with that. For me, the issue is that uh, for municipalities, they need to remember two things mainly. One is to deliver services that will improve the lives of the people, but secondly is to also attract uh, some form of uh, economic activities that will make people to be able to get you know, employment, to have uh, you know, a, an improvement in the quality of life, and therefore they themselves and the municipalities can even improve their revenue out of that process. And that is something that we have to work towards. Okay. And right now we have a, an economy that is not coping uh, with the demands for job creation, 
well, for the life and the quality of life people are that are, are aspiring for. And it's something that we have to work together collectively as a country to build this economy. And in building this economy, we then need to understand that you know, economic activity takes place in each and every ward, in each and every part of the country, in every municipality. And therefore, we need to look at different mechanisms to bring out uh, you know, um, uh, economic uh, activities and investments into areas where people live. Yeah. Because most of the time, when people move, they are actually following opportunities where they can have you know, good income and good growth and improvement of their own personal uh, quality of life. And so this is an issue that we must work on. So I always raise this issue with uh, uh, leaders in municipalities and even in our uh, cocktail that at the end of the day, we need to actually, you know, uh, create a particular standard of basic services that are rendered to our people, basic services in terms of governance, in terms of financial recovery, in terms of services that are given to our people, and therefore make it possible for more investors to come in to take, you know, uh, to bring investment and to grow the economy in those areas, as well as empowering everybody so that whoever is in the community have their own skills that they can use to build the economy around them. Everyone must be able to contribute to the economy, mm -hmm. but it has to be about a whole, uh, you know, macro organization at the level of the state, at the level of, uh, you know, you know uh, larger corporates to look at what do we do to bring more investment into some of these areas. There's no other magic. And so I believe that, you know, when the municipalities realize that they are also in the forefront in the fight against poverty, inequality and unemployment, then of course you need even the mindset of the mayors and the councillors to be very different to the way that we're running the services now. So I suppose uh, as you sort of look into uh, these municipalities, you would have looked into the 7% the of the municipalities that you talk <coughs> about, the country's municipalities, which are uh, said to be uh, performing properly. Uh, what are they getting right? I, I, I would assume you're also looking into what they are getting right in terms of uh, the running of the municipalities there. Well, basically, it's these five issues that I'm talking about. Yeah. You know, governance, the municipality has to be governed properly. And uh, the, the proof of governance is the clean street. The proof of governance is fixing of potholes. The proof of good governance is, uh, you know, no litter, no dumping, no sewage spilling all over. Yes. Issue of financial recovery is about uh, ensuring that the municipality has got additional revenue outside that comes from national government that they can use to augment the services. And that's where you really want to see. It also is about, you know, a fairness in the way that their procurement process is run. So you don't have nepotism, you don't have favoritism, you don't have people who come and do, you know, shady job. And then in the process, they do not... Um, uh, you know, get uh, accountable uh, for that and they don't get, you know, uh, held accountable for the, you know, projects that are incomplete when they collapse during the course of the process and they don't have, you know, uh, uh, all of the work done and so people have got, you know, uh, floor slabs, foundation slabs and no house and this, the, the road was not finished and all of that. Th those things need to be dealt with. But then, of course, the issue of uh, fighting corruption. And fight against corruption needs to be an issue that all of us know, that there isn't anyone who can have an excuse for having been corrupt. We have to take a st strong stand. Community must be in the forefront, mm. and they must also be very vocal about corruption. And, of course, even the staff, uh, those municipal uh, officials and councillors must be in the forefront of fighting corruption, even amongst their own members who might be in that particular area. So it's very, very important. But the last one is the issue of political leadership. Political leaders need to ensure that there's no political instability. They must ensure that there's no infighting, no factionalism in the municipality because you end up with the speaker and the mayor not working together. You end up with one group of the caucus not working together with the other. You end yeah. up with one part of the coalition fighting the other part. You end up with the speaker... <clears throat> Uh, the mayor and the municipal manager are not agreed and you've got people, you know, uh, joining into groups of uh, political alignments which are not necessary. All of these things we have to clean up. Now, you know, I can't imagine, Minister, the pile of work you have in front of your desk at the moment. And I want to bring <coughs> up another issue that I, is on your desk, too. So, uh, you know, you, you, you've spoken in the past about um, municipalities owing um, for electricity. And, um, I mean, surely this, this, is, this is unacceptable. Do you think that perhaps um, threats to cut off are seen as, you know, empty threats? 
and we know that often these are challenged in court anyway. You've said that this is something that needs to be dealt with uh, quite urgently. How and, and, and what's, what's, your, what's your plan, Minister? Well, firstly, <clears throat> whether it's municipality um, owing uh, uh, ESCOM or water board or it's ESCOM cutting off electricity or people protesting against uh, electricity cutoffs and all of that, mm -hmm. it's all desperate measures. Yeah. Fundamentally, <clears throat> there's an issue that needs to be looked at here. In the first instance, uh, we're dealing with this debt. Uh, at the moment, I think about 16 billion that uh, the municipalities owe to ESCOM. Uh, but you see, uh, the municipalities, some of them uh, have more debt than just ESCOM. So they owe water boards, they owe other service providers, they owe a lot of other people. Yeah. So there's something wrong with their uh, financial recovery model. So we need to go and deal with that. Then uh, there are others where uh, the municipalities are owed by communities, where people have uh, illegal connections, people don't, do not pay, and so on. But in some instances, when you deal with this, it's because there's been flooding of... Uh, uh, you know, in for, in, informal settlements and people are connecting willy-nilly and therefore c causing the electricity uh, to be, you know, tripped off. But those whose uh, uh, responsibilities to pay, they are feeling that this electricity is actually being used by so many other people. So it's a very complex area. Yeah. We have a team now that is doing, uh, working on advising us on how to close this thing. As far as I'm concerned, I think the first issue that needs to be done government in general, including ESCOM and municipalities, need to work together in a program that will commit municipalities to continuously pay for their debt on an ongoing basis mm -hmm. without needing to be taken to court. Secondly, the municipalities need to be assisted with their financial recovery so that they can pay ESCOM, pay water boards, pay other you know, uh, service providers, and in the process, their own system of financial recovery and management of finances have to be improved and so we're working on that. That's why we've got the team that's dealing with that. Then uh, in addition, we need to actually go out to the communities and encourage a, color, a culture of payment for services <clears throat> so that everybody pays whatever they can pay. Yeah. And I think that uh, you know, if you go to most of the rural areas, people use the prepaid and they, they, they are able to budget and use the electricity on the basis of what, they can, what, of what they can afford. And I think that that model might actually be more useful because in, if you look into the other areas, there's quite a little, there's quite a, a problem in the recovery because of, uh, you know, the conventional meterage, uh, metering system mm. and, and that's causing a bit of a difficulty. Now, on the other side, there's an issue of as common municipalities, servicing people in the same area, but uh, municipalities are collecting on the one side, ESCOM is supposed to collect on the other. That issue needs to be solved as well. So we are hoping that this team will come up by the end of uh, August, uh, and certainly early, February, early September, to be able to give us the solutions to solve all of these issues. We have given them uh, you know, a whole outline of things that need to be given attention to, including the issue of the mandate uh, between the municipalities and ESCOM, because now when the municipalities uh, do, uh, default, uh, the industries take, uh, uh, the industries take uh, municipalities to court uh, and government to court, and they want to pay straight to ESCOM. Again, it is causing an imbalance in the system that we need to solve. So all of these issues, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, end of, of, of August and early September, we'll be able to table a proposed report or a proposed solution on what needs to be done to solve this problem. And I'm very confident that we'll be able to solve this problem at that level. Minister, I'm going to take <coughs> advantage of you being here in front of me, and this may not be a topic you want to necessarily go into, but let me delve in it nonetheless. Um, the issue of uh, VBS Mutual Bank has, uh, and the sort of unearthed uh, corruption that was found there, was seen to have been linked to some of the municipal issues and municipal mismanagement uh, that we've seen. You've come out saying, and you've sort of poured cold water on claims that uh, the, the ANC wants to rescue uh, the embattled VBS Mutual Bank. What do you make of uh, these claims um, that, uh, you know, the, the ANC is trying to sort of help or bail out uh, those who found themselves uh, in trouble of this, this kind of, I suppose, mismanagement that we found and corruption that we found there? Well, I think let's start with the first issue, yeah. that uh, the municipalities... 
14 of them put money into VBS for, uh, as a, an investment. <coughs> Excuse me. This investment is against Treasury regulations. Whether they agree or not is neither here nor there. The point is that Treasury has ruled that those are not uh, supposed to have been done. So that's one issue. Secondly, 1.65 um, uh, billion rand went into this system, and uh, that is loss of money that was destined for service delivery. Mm. That's unacceptable. Mm. Thirdly, we have actually, from the point of view of the um, COCTA, we have gone on to summon all the mayors and municipal managers and CFOs to ask them why they did this. We are not satisfied with the answer. We have therefore said the Treasury and COCTA at provincial level must investigate them all and then submit the report firstly to those councils so that they must take action. There has to be consequences on those who are involved and then next they must then take the, give the reports uh, to um, uh, reserve Bank, so that the Reserve Bank can then uh, align all of these issues as they go through the forensic process, yeah. which is uh, being uh, followed very closely by the Hawks and Special Investigation Units of the police, so that they can actually charge those who are involved, and therefore I uproot the entire network as it were. So that is where the situation is, and so with the municipalities, we have said to them that they must re structure their budget so that communities don't immediately suffer because of this, com the, the, this kind of loss and they must go out and explain to the people out there. This issue of the ANC having raised the matter, I don't have much information uh, as to what was involved. What I'm aware of is that there was a concern when uh, a lot of individuals who had actually put their own money in VBS were now uh, you know, s uh, sleeping uh, outside the bank day and night during rainy days and therefore waiting to see how, them, how their money is going to be repaid mm. and some of the stock files and, and funeral uh, groups that were uh, all uh, uh, you know, in the process affected. So my understanding is that that is where the concern would have come from to say what is it that can be done to assist those people. But it is not possible that the ANC can solve this issue uh, 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 in any other way outside what government, the police, the Reserve Bank are already doing. Yeah. And I think the concern arises out of that to say what can be done in this situation, but it's not because uh, ANC at a national level uh, has got a different solution, as it were. What the uh, uh, local leaders would have probably been affected is when people, when they're inundated with people who are coming to say, do something, help us, and so on, that uh, they would then say, uh, you know, I think from what I saw in the document, they said they don't know what is happening on yeah. the matter. I think they need to be given enough information, and they must all cooperate with the uh, crime, uh, criminal investigation process, we must also assist the Reserve Bank, and all of those, the police who are involved in the investigation to solve this issue. But there is obviously a need for us to uh, see what support can be given to people who are out there so that they must, uh, you know, they must ultimately be able to get whatever is uh, st uh, still available through that process that the curator and the Reserve Bank are doing. I mean, as I understand it's all <coughs> going well that, you know, we've, we've un the, this, this kind of uh, corruption has been unearthed and uh, there's been light uh, shed on this. But at the end of the day, some of these municipal leaders could say in justification, look, we were just trying to give support to a black bank. And that's basically where uh, the ANC government uh, should be wanting to push in that direction of having, uh, you know, a time where we can have uh, black banks uh, in, in, in the country. I mean, this is obviously called caused um, distrust in terms of having that as any kind of possibility. And I know this is probably a question uh, for Treasury Minister, but what is your, your view on that? The fact that this has kind of uh, taken us a step <clears throat> backwards, if, if, if one can put it that way. I, I would say it is a setback that uh, a bank that was primarily uh, supposed to service black community uh, led by black uh, professionals that it goes this route. It is a setback. Uh, but I don't think that on its own we must actually be discouraged uh, from creating such institutions where, because the need for them is there. In this case, uh, our focus should actually be that uh, whether these were black or white or green or whatever people, if there's 
fraud, then we deal with it as fraud. Mm -hmm. If the issue is people have taken advantage of money which was destined for poor people in service delivery or in personal savings, in personal savings, that uh, situation is unacceptable. We need to act on it as such. All right, Minister, it's been a great pleasure having you here with us. Thank you very much Thank for you. giving us your time this morning. Thank you. You're welcome.